morning. Happy Father's Day to those of you who are fathers. I especially bring Happy Father's Day greetings to those of you who, like me, uh, haven't yet heard from your kids and will not hear from them till this afternoon, and haven't yet seen your father, and I won't call mine till this afternoon, but uh, Happy Father's Day greetings. Um, one, of the thing about, one of the things about being a father is you want to be remembered at least at some point along the way as being a wise man. Uh, today's sermon is called Model Wisdom, so today's sermon is probably an appropriate sermon from an appropriate text considering that it's Father's Day. As you know, this is our last week in the series of the Sermon on the Mount. I appreciate those of you who have continued reading in chapters 5, 6, and 7 and listening uh, so carefully to what Christ has said to us in the Sermon on the Mount. Next week, we begin a new series. The series will be called Transformed, and for 10 weeks, we'll be looking at chapters 12 through 16 of the book of Romans, Transformed, beginning next week. Uh, So that brings us to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. These are Jesus' last words on the Sermon on the Mount. Normally, last words are considered important words, so I'd like you to think about these being his last words of this particular sermon as we read. If you would join me by standing in honor of God's Word, and I will read from chapter 7, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell." And great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Please be seated. Will you pray with me? Dear God, your word has challenged us regularly over these past 18 weeks. The words of your son, Jesus, who he spoke so much more clearly than we ever can, are so powerful. We pray today that your Holy Spirit might take these words, not just help us understand them, but help us to obey them. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you remember this photo? This is a photo that was taken last year. Uh, This is a photo of uh, what was left after Hurricane Michael hit Mexico Beach on the Gulf Coast. The one house that is still standing, ironically, was called the Sand Palace. Now, why was that house still standing at the end of the storm? Was the owner lucky? that somehow the storm surge divided before it got to his house? Uh, Did he use a stronger eight-foot two-by-fours than the house next to him? The reason why his house was still standing is because it was intentionally designed and built for just such a storm. In fact, if you read the story, and many people in the first hour immediately went on their phones and started looking this up. Don't do that. Do it after the service. But, but the man says he built this house to withstand 240 miles an hour wind. This storm had winds of 140. But that's why it was intentionally designed and built. Now, were the houses to the left and the right flawed in their construction techniques? No, they followed the accepted building practices at that time. Well, were they cheap homes that were just put up too quickly? No, in fact, just the opposite is true. Many of them were expensive homes, and they were thought to be well-built. In fact, many of the homeowners would have considered it their dream homes. But I have to tell you that since I first saw this picture, I cannot read today's passage and not think of that picture. So today we will dive deeper into a Sunday school story that we all know, The story of a storm, two men, two houses, 
and two results. Again, here we are at the end of Jesus preaching and Sermon on the Mount. He's wrapping up his teaching, and he comes to this last amazing, well-known analogy. And what he's saying is, he's summarizing, Have you heard clearly everything that I'm saying to you? Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine, do you get it? Are you listening? And then he says, do you, do you understand? And that's good, but then he goes on with this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. So his last paragraph, his last part of his sermon is a call for action. And that's a call for action to us today too. What will we do with what Jesus has said? We'll study this passage under the heading of four realities, four truths about our lives today. Four realities. The first reality, storms will come. Storms will come Scripture tells us this. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, In this world you will have trouble. Isaiah 43, 2 says, When you pass through the water, I will be with you. He doesn't say, if you pass through the water. When you do, storms are going to come. If you look through Scripture, you will not wa find one place anywhere in Scripture where it says, do this, believe this, say this, and you won't have storms. And everything will go perfectly. That's contrary to the teachings of some that we may listen to on the radio or on the TV, but a life without storms is impossible. Don't be fooled. Storms will come. I'd like to look at our text today and make a few observations about this storm and about storms from the story. First of all, this was not a small storm. This was a serious storm. The rain fell, and it fell to the degree that floods came. The winds blew, and the winds blew to the degree that they beat against the house. It was not a small storm. Second observation, it was not an unusual or an unexpected storm. Certain parts of the world, certain parts of our country today, you expect certain weather patterns. You are going to have certain storms. And even in the Middle East, at the time of Jesus, when we think, well, this is commonly uh, perceived of as a desert uh, weather patterns, even then storms came. You've seen pictures of the Middle East and you see those, those wadis, those uh, empty uh, gulches or valleys where rivers used to, to, to run. Well, when it rains, those wadis fill up and become raging torrents during the storm. And, and that's what Jesus was speaking of and they would have understood that. Storms in life are to be expected. They're not unusual. This storm had serious consequences. One of the consequences of storms for us, especially when we're young, is fear. We're afraid of storms. This was not just a storm that you had to be afraid of. This was a storm that brought damage. Well, some of us have lived through some storms where there was damage. Perhaps hail has damaged your siding, or a windstorm came so bad that it ripped off some of your shingles. It's not that kind of a storm either. This was a storm that had serious consequences. One house actually fell. It was demolished. It was complete destruction. We read it fell, and great was the fall of it. Now, I'm not saying none of us have ever been through that kind of a storm. I know I haven't. If you had, you could enlighten us. But this was a storm that had serious consequences. And perhaps I'm going to say nothing that's too profound right here, but the storms in our life, they too have serious consequences. We all know that. The storms we're going through have serious consequences. Fourth observation, this storm was survivable. It was important to remember this. In spite of all the potential for damage, it was not hopeless. At the end of this storm, one house stood tall. So as you're going through storms, you are not without hope. In all, in all of our lives today, we have storms. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, and he already says he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. The fact is we're all going to have storms. Now, I have to be honest. I do not know you well enough, most of you, to know what your storms are. But I have a pretty good idea. Your storms just might be physical. You're sitting here today and you're in pain. And the people around you don't know how badly you hurt. Or you're sitting here today and disease has just struck your family. 
or struck you. Or perhaps you have a long-term condition and the treatment is almost as bad as the disease itself. Physical storms can be debilitating. Physical storms can be serious. Or some here today have relational storms. No one knows it, but you're afraid a divorce is coming. Perhaps you've just gone through a breakup with someone that you've had a long-term relationship with. Perhaps you're in a fight and you and that person no longer talk to each other and you used to be close. Relational storms. Some of you this morning are going through emotional storms. You've been put down. You've been yelled at. You've been abused for so long that hope is nearly gone. In fact, maybe some of you today feel that hope is gone. Another storm we don't like to talk about this one, is financial storms. You know, nobody ever makes plans to have a financial difficulty. On the contrary, we make plans that we will be financially secure. Some of us make a lot of plans and we work hard, but yet some find promises broken, companies bought and sold, jobs don't materialize, things don't work out, and you find yourself in financial difficulties. Those are painful storms, spiritual storms. Let's be honest. Some of us are just disappointed with God. We're disappointed with God's people. We're disappointed with this whole faith thing. We have a spiritual storm. And the bad part about all these storms is they pile up. I have a friend right now who right now is going through four out of five of those storms at the same time. And I say, God, how can that person survive as they go through these storms? Interesting fact about storms is they have this thing called a Category 5 storm. And in a Category 5 storm, you will not be able to stand up. You either had to be tied down or be in some sort of protection and when a Category 5 storm hits, you will not be able to stand up. And one thing about Category 5 storms is they're not necessarily predictable. Oh, sometimes you get a little inkling that something might happen. And if you can see it coming down the road, perhaps you're a little bit stronger. But sometimes you just get blindsided. And you're not ready. You know, the storms that we're going through have the potential to injure us and even to kill us. One final observation about storms. Storms themselves are not caused or created by our faith or our lack of faith. Storms show the quality of our faith. Hurricane Michael did not make the sand palace strong. The fact that the sand palace and other houses were built there did not bring on the storm, but Hurricane Michael showed which houses were strong and which were not. We talk about the differences between our trials and our temptations. Our temptations are brought on us by the evil one to make us fall. Trials are brought on and allowed by God to show that we can stand. And storms are these trials. If you would have taken that picture of that house the day before the storm hit, it would have been one of many nice houses along that beachfront. You wouldn't have noticed a big difference between that house and the house next to it. It looked just like the rest, but storms will come. Second reality, not only will storms come, houses get built. We call this process life. We're all building houses. It's not optional. You can't decide not to do it. Life happens. You are building a house. Now, when my wife and I decided to build a house, we learned that good preparatory work is essential. You don't just show up and start digging. Uh, we talked about it, and, and we planned, and I remember drawing, th drawing pictures on napkins. What about this? What about this? Uh, you and your spouse maybe perhaps make plans. And, and then you get a blueprint. You show your napkin to an architect or an engineer. And then you buy a lot. You, you plan a location, and you consider many factors, and you engage the builder. And 
with his help, you get the approval and permits that you need. And then you begin on the foundation. Now, you've already been planning for a long time and nothing has transpired on your lot. Preparatory work is important. But in our text today, the foundation seems to be key. So I'm going to spend a little time here on the foundation. In, the, in our passage, it says, uh, the foolish man built his house on sand. The foundation was sand. The wise man put his foundation on rock. The point is, uh, the foundation, if it's on something that moves, like sand, it's in danger. If it's built on something that is stationary, like a rock, it will last. Um, as you're reading this afternoon about the sand palace, that man took and drove his um, pillars 40 feet down. 40 feet down to get to a solid foundation. Um, some of you know I went to Brazil and lived there for six months. And I lived on a missions compound that was right on the Amazon River. And the only way you could get there was by boat. You couldn't, if you had an emergency, get in a car and drive to a hospital. So the, the fact that you could launch boats in a, in a moment was important. And that particular missions base had two boat launches. The Amazon River fell 45 vertical feet that year. At low water, there was the place they called the rocks. It was about a tenth of a mile downstream. And in among the rocks, they had poured a concrete boat launch. And that boat launch hadn't moved in the 50 years since they poured it. Because that boat launch was poured in among the rocks. But when the water was high, you just had to try to launch your boat from the beach. And so they had built a, a concrete ramp on the beach. And every year, that water going by at six feet a second would erode it and erode it and erode it. And it kept destroying the, the boat launches. The boat launch that was built on the rocks lasted. The boat launch on the sand did not. You know, there's multiple factors we need to take into account considering foundations. In this part of the world, there's a 36-inch rule. That is, 36 inches down is the frost line. Your foundation has to be at least 36 inches down. And if you don't, frost will get underneath your foundation. And as it heaves the ground, your foundation will buckle. One of my neighbors invested $20,000 in a stone sitting area out and back. A lot of stonework done, very beautiful, very ornate and round and benches and pillars and gates. He had a six-foot waterfall as part of this stone outdoor seating area, but he never dug the foundation deep enough. And every year, the ice gets underneath it and moves it. All of the benches are now leaning out. The waterfall is eight inches out of plumb, and he just talked to me that he's going to have to tear it down. Foundation work is important. Foundations can be out of concrete. Foundations can be out of stone. Foundations are even made out of wood. I grew up in a farmhouse that was built in 1870. The, the walls in the basement go down eight feet into the ground, and these huge rocks are the base of the wall. And then the stone walls in the basement go up to about seven and a half feet in the basement. Huge stone wall. And then on top of that, wall, they went and put uh, an oak log, 12 inches by 10 inches. And that oak log is still about 6 inches below the ground line. Um, that oak log lasted for 140 years, but my house is now 150 years old. And my brother who lives there is trying to decide what he can do to rescue the fact that his foundation along the front of his house is gone. And so Jesus would say, you need a sure foundation. Paul tells us what a sure foundation is. In 1 Corinthians 3, he said, your foundation should be Jesus Christ. No other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Make sure Jesus Christ is the foundation of your life. And in Ephesians chapter 2, he said... <coughs> Your life should be founded on Scripture, the teaching of the apostles and the prophets, and prayer, the time you spend with God in communication and relationship. Is that what the foundation of your life is based on? Jesus Christ, Scripture, and prayer. Back to the house we're building. 
It's been two months now. You still don't see anything above the ground, but the foundation is done. Now you're ready to see the house taking off and see something happen. Quality workmanship is essential. You need to be following the building codes. You need to have the supplies right there. You need to have the tools there that you need. You need to line up your subcontractors and use the right methods. You need to follow the right schedule. Make sure you have enough money to pay for all the bills. Too often on the news we see examples of people who didn't do all this. I saw two pictures this week. One was of a picture of a bridge that led from a a shore out to an island in the middle of a pond and that bridge was ornate and beautiful and decorated and standing smiling on the bridge were the bride and the groom and the bridal party. And the second picture was the bride and the groom and the bridal party climbing up out of the water because the bridge had collapsed and they all fell into the pond. It looked beautiful, but had not been built to the code that it should have been built up to, so also spiritually with us. There's a code book we need to follow. It's God's Word, the Bible. It's our rule book. You know, my, my dad is a builder, was a builder, and he always uh, said to me, let's do it right the first time. It may take longer, it may be harder, but do it right the first time, and you won't have to go back. The same spiritually. Get your foundation right. Make sure the workmanship is good. And then it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we need to use quality materials. It said each man's work will become manifest. It will be judged. It will be standing a test. The test will come and it will show whether his house was built with wood, hay, and stubble or gold, silver, and precious stones. What are you building with today? Your spiritual house. Storms will come. Houses get built. The third reality. Wisdom will be rewarded. What is rewarded today when you build a house? Well, beauty is, repo- beauty is rewarded. Beauty is appreciated. If we have any uh, realtors here, we call this curb appeal. You've been there. You've driven by a house and you stop and you look and you say, that's a gorgeous house. That's being rewarded. Or functionality is appreciated. You want a house that works and the traffic flow is great. The house just works. Strength is appreciated. Everyone likes a strong house that's going to be there for a while. Um, If you ever go to sell your house, good resale value is appreciated. So we get it. Those of us who own homes, we plan and take steps that will increase all of these rewards. And so also in the story of the storm here, there was a reward, and the reward was at the end of the storm, the house was still standing. There was a reward. Wisdom tells us that the time to prepare for storms is well before they hit. Two days before Hurricane Michael hit the coast, people were alerted that a storm might be coming. And you saw all the pictures on the news for two days. People were boarding up windows and they were sealing up all their cracks and they were stacking up sandbags and they were shoring up walls and then they moved out. The owner of the sand palace also moved out, but his preparation was already done, so he didn't have to do anything. In fact, he went inland and turned on all his cameras that he had back at the house and watched the whole storm hit his house. When the storm was over, he knew his house hadn't, co- hadn't collapsed. It was fine. He watched it on his cameras and on his video feed. His house was fine. Let me ask you a question. When is the best time to plant a tree? The answer is 20 years ago. <laughs> but we don't work that way. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Now. Now. Okay, when's the best time to prepare for a storm? Before the storm comes, way before the storm comes, not in the middle of the storm. Uh, Today would be a good day to begin to prepare for the storms that will still come in your life so that like the man with the sand palace, you can sit back and watch in confidence as the storm comes. Wisdom will be rewarded. Notice that the same storm hit both men. The difference was one was wise, one was foolish. 
One planned for the storm, one didn't. One built on a solid rock foundation, one didn't. And the benefit of that wisdom for the man that was wise was a benefit both for him and for those that were with him. I don't know if you saw on the house of the sand palace, could you tell there was a house right behind it? The storm surge came in, the sand palace blocked it, and there's one house standing right behind the sand palace. There's an, I'm going to show the picture again today so you'll see it. The benefit was not just for the man in the house, but those nearby. And so with you today, if you live a life that has a strong foundation and it's based in God's wisdom, there will be benefits to you here and now, benefits in the future in glory, but there will also be benefits for your family and benefits for those around you. In your life, if you build with wisdom, wisdom will be rewarded. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall. That's encouraging. That's rewarding. Can you imagine the man who built the house down there at the coast when he got back to his house two days later? All he knew coming in was that his house had survived. And as he arrived and saw everything else flat, yes, there was gratitude that his house had survived, but sadness for all those around him. Fourth reality. One final reality. Obedience counts. Obedience counts. Look again at the text. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man. What does Jesus say was the difference? Obedience. Obedience is that thing that sets the wise man apart from the foolish man. Verse 26, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, he will be the foolish man. Notice the difference is not a difference in hearing. The difference is not even a difference in understanding. The only difference between the wise man and the foolish man is the difference in obeying. Now I'm going to ask what you may think might be a silly question. Why should we obey? We've already partially answered that. We obey because the benefit is great. We obey because the consequences are not, for not obeying can be catastrophic. But there's another reason why we obey. And that's that Jesus Christ is a trustworthy authority. You know, when we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, we often skip those last two verses. Look at verses 28 and 29. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. You know, in that day there was an accepted way to teach if you were a rabbi or if you were a scribe. You brought around you your disciples or your students and you would cover a talk about a specific topic and then you would show how much you knew by quoting everybody else. You'd say, well, Moses says this about this and David says this about this and the Talmud says this and the Mishnah says this and by the way, Rabbi Hillel says this and Rabbi Shimai says this and you got to show how much you knew as a teacher as you shared all this. That is not the way Jesus taught but that's how they were used to rabbis teaching. What Jesus said is, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you this. How many times in the Sermon on the Mount does he say something like, therefore I tell you. Jesus spoke with authority. You ought to follow that authority. Let's suppose you were going on vacation to Hawaii, and you decided you wanted to be a scuba diver. And over here is a, a scuba school. And there's three instructors, and it costs you $100, and they're going to teach you for three hours before they let you get close to the water, and you can tell that the equipment has been used but well-maintained. And over here, I'm standing, and I got brand new equipment. And I say, come with me, I'm cheaper, we can figure this out. I think this goes in your mouth. Maybe this strap goes in your back. Where would you go to to learn how to scuba dive? You'd go to the authority, the one that you trusted. And that's what the, the people on the Sermon on the Mount said. Jesus teaches with authority. I'm going to follow him. Will you follow Jesus' authority today? There's another way that obedience counts. Obedience counts in that God promises to be with us in the storms. 
Proverbs chapter 10, 25 says it this way. When the tempest passes, the wicked is no more, but, righteous, but the righteous is established forever. Obedience brings God's presence. Romans chapter 8, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, verses 35 and 37 say this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or danger, or sword, and we could add, or storms? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. God will be with us. He will not leave us. He wants our obedience. In conclusion, there were two men, there were two houses, there were two approaches, both men heard, both men built, both men expected that their house would survive, but only one obeyed. Jesus says, he who hears and does my words is wise. Notice, he doesn't say he's smart as opposed to a stupid man. He says he's wise as opposed to foolish. If it were smart and stupid, that might be about knowledge. This is not about knowledge. This is about obedience. Consider this photo one more time. Which man do you want to be? The man in the middle? Or the house on the left? Or the house on the right? Jesus said, the wise man is the one who obeys, and his house will stand. One more thought. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, says this, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded. How many of you just caught that I quoted that wrong? Raise your hand. You see, not many of us. We're very quick to be comfortable with that teaching them all that I have commanded. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. Even in the Great Commission, obedience comes to the front. Obedience is wisdom. Wisdom is obedience. So, fathers and others, let us be wise. Let us be obedient. Let's pray. Dear God, to be obedient is hard work. We try regularly and we fail. We acknowledge we need your Holy Spirit to help us live lives of obedience, but that is our goal today because we see the benefits, because you're our authority because we want our house to survive for you. Amen.